Hello, this is the Level 2 Awarded Food Safety in Catrium, and my name is Dave Summers. So let's have a look at the course content which we're going to cover in this Level 2 Award. An introduction to food safety, basic microbiology, food poisoning and foodborne disease, personal hygiene, design and construction of food premises and kitchens, food pests and control, cleaning and disinfection, and lastly, food safety legislation. So let's have a look at lecture one, which is an introduction to food safety. The aim of this unit is to increase your awareness of food poisoning. And by the end of this unit, you should be able to give reasons why we need food hygiene, state the symptoms and causes of food poisoning, and name the at-risk groups. So let's have a look at some definitions um, and these are the sort of questions which do come up quite often in the final exam and in the revision tests. So safe food is classed as food which is free from contaminants and will not cause illness or disease. As a customer you must insist on safe food. Obviously you don't want to eat food and become ill as a result of it and as a food handler you must insist on the food which you handle. It does not contain any contaminants from yourself or from the environment. Another definition, food hygiene, are all measures necessary to ensure the safety of food. So if you like, it's like a food safety chain where the first link in the chain is the supplier, the final link then is the customer. You've got to look after that food safety chain. You've got to make sure that nothing comes into contact with food which shouldn't come into contact with food. So it's looking after food from supplier to customer and that's all the practices involved in looking after food and that's food hygiene. So let's look at the causes of food poisoning. The first cause of food poisoning are bacteria. The bacteria is a plural word, bacterium is a single word, so bacteria uh, many bacteriums, if you like. Now, bacterial food poisoning, they are responsible for the majority of food poisoning outbreaks, with a staggering 80% of all food poisoning caused by bacteria. Other causes are molds, or rather not all the sort of everyday molds you see, perhaps green mold on bread or on cream, but certain molds uh, do give rise to mycotoxins, uh, which means fungal poisons, if you like. And these happen uh, like ocrotoxin and toxin A from different uh, products. Um, normally get it with things like grains or feeds, might get it some some vegetables. It's not very common, but it does cause a problem. Next would be chemicals, things like detergents, bleaches, disinfectants, other chemicals like preservatives, uh, agricultural residues, pesticides, antibiotics, actually getting into food. Next would be metals. Now, you've got to be careful what metals you use to cook food in. <coughs> Excuse me, in particular, uh, metal, sorry, metallic containers for cooking things like acidic fruit. Now, certain acids will attack the inside of things like aluminium saucepans. Now, we've used aluminium saucepans for hundreds of years in catering, uh, but they do react badly to acidic fruit. Now, it's not necessarily going to cause poisoning per se, but it will give a metallic taint uh, to the fruit itself uh, from the saucepan, and the saucepan will actually turn black. So it's probably better to use things like stainless steel or glass saucepans. Uh, the other thing which um, I am going to graphic for, but be careful of the plastic containers which you store your foods in. Certain industrial plastics, for example, that's not meant for uh, containing food materials, do contain certain poisons like strychnine and arsenic, and that can leach into the food. So use things like Tupperware or disposable or aluminium containers that are meant for food. Another one, poisonous plants or fish. Uh, Fugu, for example, uh, a graphic there is the pufferfish. 
which is a delicacy in, in Japanese restaurants. Uh, the only thing is, if you're not licensed to prepare the puffer fish, you can end up poisoning your customer because it contains a, a very potent uh, toxin, a neurotoxin, which can kill within two minutes uh, because the uh, skin, um, the internal intestines contain the uh, neurotoxin. So you have to be licensed in order to prepare that. Uh, poisonous plants, things like deadly nightshade, uh, rhubarb leaves, for example, again, all contain different toxins. And fish, what I would say with uh, fish in particular, if you're going to use fish, uh, make sure if it's fresh that you cook it to the correct internal temperature, uh, which... Um, well, we, we do say cook to 75 degrees C, but really that's overcooking it. Uh, but this is the temperature that I'll be mentioning later on. Um, you can cook or get away with cooking fish and some uh, meats to an intern t internal temperature of 60 degrees C. Certainly around about 63 to 65 uh, is uh, a temperature that we can use for pasteurization. So that's quite a safe temperature. Um, if you like your fish undercooked, it's probably better to freeze the fish first. And the reason I'm talking about fish is because all fish, fresh fish, contain parasitic infection, little wriggly worms, if you like. And if you eat those little wriggly worms, they'll actually um, get into your intestines and could get into um, your bloodstream, depending on the type of parasite. But certainly it can make you very ill. So don't undercook fish. Um, you'll see a lot of the telly chefs saying undercook tuna, make sure it's still uh, raw in the middle. Um, that's okay as long as that fish has been frozen first. Now, it is a health and safety law in this country, in the UK, that if fish is going to be used raw, for example with sushi, then it must be frozen for at least 24 hours, then defrosted, then used as fresh, if you like. Because the freezing process will kill the parasite. Um, other natural poisons, we've got uh, fungi. Um, always make sure that you identify the uh, edible types of fungi and uh, ensure you stay away from the poisonous types. Again, some of those can be quite lethal. Green potatoes or potatoes that are sprouting. Uh, the green is a buildup of a glycalkaloid poison. Uh, it comes from chlorophyll, but it can have uh, certain effects on the human body, especially if you're young or quite old. Uh, so don't use green potatoes, don't even try to peel away the green or even rub away the sprouts because there's a poison developing underneath the sprouts. And red kidney beans, that's the dried variety. They contain a toxin which you need to deactivate by boiling for at least 15 minutes before you use them. So if you're going to use dried beans, soak them overnight, then boil them for 15 minutes and then just sit them until they are tender. Uh, not allergies. Now, what I mean by that is um, an allergic reaction to food is not food poisoning. So it's really the body being fooled, uh, or rather the brain being fooled, into thinking it's just ingested poisonous materials. Uh, I'll give an example of peanut allergy. There are 14 in total, which I'll go through in a, in a minute or two. But the brain, uh, say for example, it's, it's, it was one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful organ in the body. And it must maintain uh, the, the body in work in order. So it, it messages the body, different parts of the body on a regular basis. And if it recognizes that a poison has just been ingested and uh, the brain realizes this through years of experience if you like in recognizing the different uh, foods that we ingest or drinks we ingest and it will send uh, a message to the immune system to actually uh, destroy or fight against the poison that is, it thinks it's just ingested. Now what happens uh, with an allergic reaction, uh, especially with food, the brain is fooled into think that um, uh, something like peanuts or shellfish or fish or milk um, are poisons. 
Now, nobody, not even scientists, know why this happens. Uh, you could, for example, eat peanuts for about 40 odd years with no ill effects, and then on one day, uh, you feel a bit of tingling in the mouth and you will develop an allergic reaction. It's really the brain being fooled into think that for, for whatever reason, that it's a poison being ingested. Uh, allergies, uh, food allergies can be life-threatening. They can give rise to an anaphylactic reaction, uh, which can end up in respiratory failure. So again, you've got to be careful with uh, allergies in foods. I just want to go back to allergies and the biggest problem of allergies is poor communication between staff and customers. Now this is one question that's likely to come up in the exam. Um, it's the main cause of problems with allergies. Um, I've always ex already explained what allergies can cause. Uh, in fact, there might be a question on the symptoms of an allergic reaction to food and that's rash, swelling and collapse. Uh, again, it's all to do with the histamine that's released by uh, the immune system from certain cells in the body. And they cause the throat to swell uh, because that's the point of ingestion. And that's why the brain is sending these antibodies along to try to kill what it perceives to be the um, ingestion of poison. But obviously, there's nothing for it to work on because it's not a poison. So the throat swells, the person can't breathe, and they end up collapsing. So let's have a look at uh, the different allergens. A uh, question is not going to come up, but this is just really for interest's sake. Under the Food Information Regulation, December 2014, uh, it's now uh, being made uh, legal or law, if you like, that 14 allergens are to be uh, recognised as problem areas. <coughs> Excuse me, so the way allergens are labelled, as it says in there, on prepacked foods has changed. So there are 14 major allergens which need to be mentioned, either on the label or through provided information, such as menus, when they use as ingredients in the food. So here are the allergens and some examples of where they can be found. So number one is celery. This includes celery stalks, leaves, seeds, and the root called celeriac. You can find celery in celery salt, salads, some meat products, soups, and stock herbs. Cereals containing gluten is number two. Wheat, such as spelt and Khorasan wheat or kamut. Rye, barley, and oats is often found in foods containing flour, such as some types of baking powder, butter, breadcrumbs, bread, cakes, couscous, meat products, pasta, pastry sauces, soups, and fried foods, which are dusted with flour. Then number three, crustaceans, such as crabs, lobsters, prawns, and scampi. Shrimp paste, often used in Thai and Southeast Asian curries or salads, is an ingredient also to look out for. Eggs, number four, are often found in cakes, some meat products, mayonnaise, mousses, pasta, quiche, sauces and pastries or foods brushed or glazed with eggs. Number five is fish. You will find this in some fish sauces, pizzas, relishes, salad dresses, stock cubes and Worcestershire sauce. Um, and the, the fish in there is anchovies. And lupin, yes, lupin is a flower, but it's also found in flour. Lupin flour and seeds can be used in some types of bread, pastries, and even pasta. Milk is number seven. It's a common ingredient in butter, cheese, cream, milk powders, and yogurt. It can also be found in foods brushed or glazed with milk, and in powdered soups and sauces. Number eight is mollusks. These include mussels, land snails, squid, and whelks, but can also be commonly found in oyster sauce or as an ingredient in fish stews. And number nine, mustard. Liquid mustard, mustard powder, and mustard seeds fall into this category. This ingredient can also be found in bread, curries, marinades, meat products, salad dressings, sauces, and soups. Number ten, nuts, not to be mistaken with peanuts, which are actually a legume and grow in the ground. This ingredient refers to nuts which grow on trees like cashew nuts, almonds, and hazelnuts. You can find nuts in breads, biscuits, crackers, desserts, nut powders, often used in Asian curries. Stir fried dishes, ice cream, marzipan, such as almond paste, nuts, oils, and or nut oils rather than sauces. And number 11, peanuts, uh, as in mentioned uh, just now, they're actually a legume and grow in the ground. That's why sometimes it's called a ground nut. Peanuts are often used as an ingredient in biscuits, cakes, curries, desserts, sauces such as satay sauce, as well as in ground nut oil and peanut flour. And the last three, we've got sesame seeds. Uh, these can be found in bread, sprinkled on hamburger buns, for example. Breadsticks, hummus, sesame oil, tahini. 
They are sometimes toasted and used in salads. Soya, often found in bean curd, edamame seed, edamame beans, sorry, miso paste, texture soy protein, soya flour tofu. Soya is a staple ingredient in oriental food. It can also be found in desserts, ice cream, meat products, sauces and vegetarian products. And the last one, sulfur dioxide, sometimes known as sulfites. This is an ingredient often used in dried fruits, such as raisins, dried apricots and prunes. You may also find it in meat products, soft drinks, vegetables as well as in wine and beer. If you have asthma, you have a higher risk of developing a reaction to sulfur dioxide. So look us, or let's look at the reported case of food poison between 2007 and 2016. Uh, this is a bar chart, um, so called a bar because it's got these purple bars. Um, what these refer to are the figures of food poisoning, reported case of food poisoning between 2007 and 2016. 2007 we got 72,382, to 2016 70,727. All these, although these sound uh, pretty static over the last few years, uh, these are the reported cases of food poisoning, which are people that report the cases to environmental health departments and to doctors. Uh, but these don't relate to the unreported case of food poisoning. Since the year 2000, the Food Standards Agency has been sending questionnaires to people throughout the UK asking them if they've had food poisoning and indeed didn't report it. And it works out between 12 and a half and 15 percent of those people asked didn't actually report it. And that equates, if you extrapolate the information, to about 12 million cases of food poisoning every year. So we're not talking tens of thousands, we're talking millions. So why do you think uh, the reasons of the increase in food poisoning has gone up so much? Uh, well, the first thing uh, we can look at is more poultry is eaten. Poultry is very cheap. Uh, you can pick up in Goodwaldi's, for example, pick up a chicken for about three pound fifty, and I can feed a family of four. But most, if not all, poultry chickens are infected with something called Campylobacter, uh, which causes food poisoning. And it's mainly to the way they are brought up. Uh, they they brought up in small squares, um, roughly about a metre square, uh, where they'll fit in about 14 chickens. And these 14 chickens, then, as they grow up, they can't move around. They peck at each other, peck at each other's faeces, and all that um, infection then gets transferred to each other. And also, by the way, they are processed in abattoirs, causes the infection on the skins of chickens. And also be careful when you buy prepackaged uh, chickens, uh, studies have shown that the outside of the packaging also contains high levels of pathogens or food poisoning bacteria. And another reason is we eat out more or we buy foods uh, from supermarkets such as TV dinners. We might order takeaways or takeouts. We might eat at restaurants um, and cafes, etc. And the trouble is there, we've got no control of the food uh, that's being prepared. It might be being prepared by people who haven't got food hygiene qualifications. Um, that's where we get food poison. At least when you cook it yourself, you know what goes into the food, you know how it's being prepared. And there are more ethnic takeaways in restaurants in the UK than there were about 30 years ago. Again, with uh, the ethnic takeaways in restaurants, uh, the problem is the language barrier. Uh, most of the restaurants and takeaways, they employ people whose first language is uh, not English. And it's very difficult to um, find a food hygiene qualification being delivered by somebody who can talk their language. So they tend to do uh, or read it from books uh, in their own language. You can buy food hygiene uh, books in about 50 different languages. But obviously it's not the same as going to an interactive course or going to an online course um, where if you're being supported correctly you can ask questions or ask questions via email. The next one is the incorrect handling of chilled food. Market from a chiller, from a fridge, uh, things like cooked meats, uh, pâtés, uh, quiches etc. It's got to remain chilled. 
Um, if it's not, if it increases in temperature from uh, the chilled temperature between 1 and 4 degrees, then any bacteria that's present, which can be from uh, bacteria in the environment, uh, perhaps from food handlers that are full of quiches and uh, meats in the chill in the first place, then the bacteria will multiply. They'll start to grow on warm food. <coughs> so if you're buying food from a supermarket that needs to remain chilled, then you need to make sure you put it into chilled bags, put it into ice boxes, or even just mix it uh, with frozen items in the same carrier bag so it stays cold. Uh, another reason is uh, less preservatives are used these days. Uh, going back about 50 years ago, we used to use a lot of chemicals to preserve our foods. And as time has gone on and technology has improved, we have found that a lot of the chemicals that have been used can actually cause uh, different disorders and diseases. So we tend to use more uh, natural chemicals or preservatives such as vinegar, uh, sugar and salt. Um, another reason for the increase in food poisoning, especially during the summer period, is the use of barbecues. Now, there's two reasons why barbecues are a problem. Uh, the first reason is that you're dealing with raw and cooked food. Now, one question that might come up uh, on the exam is, what should you always do with raw and cooked food? You must always keep them separate. And it's the same with barbecues. Uh, when you're cooking uh, meats on the barbecues, you must ensure that the raw meat doesn't come into contact with the cooked meat. So just keep them totally separate. And wash your hands between uh, cooked and raw as well. Also, when you're cooking on a barbecue, it tends to cook by fierce heat. And the heat then could... Uh, make the outside of the, the product uh, burnt if you like and you think it's cooked well on the inside it's not cooked and uh, remember this all raw meat contains food poisoning bacteria which can cause illness and possibly death and the last one for this one is intensive farming and feeding and this is where for example uh, i give an example of the poultry where you've got 14 chickens in a square meter uh, that's intensive farming. Then you've got intensive feeding also, where uh, farmers will, for want to get their animals to the market a bit quicker, uh, they'll feed their animals supplemental feeds. Uh, and a lot of these feeds are not sterilized, and therefore the feeds themselves will contain uh, different uh, bacteria, parasites, and other fungal diseases uh, that can cause problems with the animal. So the most common cause of food poisoning, a question could come up as uh, asking you that, and it is food prepared too far in advance. So let's have a look at the benefits of good food hygiene. Obviously safe food means higher profits, but why? Well, firstly, uh, the company will have a good reputation, a business will have a good reputation. Uh, you'll get satisfied customers, so that means repeat custom. Increase productivity by staff working in a clean environment. Brand protection, uh, for example, you take McDonald's, they've got a very good food hygiene policies, so they protect their brand. Obviously, if one restaurant uh, causes food poisoning, they all be tarnished by the same brush, so to speak. Then we've got legal compliance, because it is the law at the end of the day. Good working conditions, again, that's very good for staff, again, giving increased productivity. There's reduced risk of food poisoning, longer shelf life on products, because part of the uh, of food hygiene is really checking on your dates of your products to make sure they don't grow out of date, so that is part of the policy. And lastly, higher staff morale, again, because they're working in a clean environment, you won't get staff leaving the company uh, because of poor work conditions. And then on the flip side of the coin, what are the costs of poor food hygiene? Unsafe food means lower profits. Well, why? Well, there's the increased risk of food poisoning, food complaints from customers who then wouldn't return, brand damage, loss of business, closure, fines and legal costs, which can run into millions of pounds, Cost of civil action. Uh, civil action really is somebody has food poisoning. They take uh, out an action. They sue the company for causing food poisoning. 
Uh, they claim that money then lost through not being able to go to work, for example, uh, back from the company. Uh, pest infestations. Uh, so if you've got uh, poor hygienic practices, uh, there might be uh, dirt and food debris that will attract pests, which with them bring their own diseases. Uh, a lot of waste food if uh, there's unsanitary conditions, loss of production and high staff turnover, so low staff morale. So what is food poisoning? Well, let's have a look at the symptoms of food poisoning first of all. There are four major symptoms and these are given um, in relation to if we ingest some poisonous food. It starts off with nausea which is the feeling of being sickness. Uh, we end up with vomiting, which is uh, releasing all the poisonous material. Abdominal pain, followed by diarrhea. Now these symptoms are not caused by the bacteria per se, but it's caused by your immune system reacting to the onslaught of poisonous material. Uh, remember when I mentioned uh, about food allergies? Uh, this is slightly similar in as much as the brain, via receptors, um, let's just go back a step, all of our bodies are outside of our body, the inside of our body, in our mouth, down through our esophagus, down the stomach, um, they've got things called receptors or chemoreceptors, chemical receptors, and when these receptors come into contact with any chemical such as food, then it sends a message to the brain, and the brain usually interprets uh, the food uh, as good or bad. If it's bad, then it will get in touch with the immune system to start taking action. And so if you ingest uh, food poisoning bacteria, the brain knows that these are bad for the body because at the end of the day, the brain wants to make sure the body survives because it's holding the brain in place. And um, if the body dies, then thus the brain dies. So it's in the brain's best interest to make sure that it controls everything that goes into the body. So the chemoreceptors send a message to the brain. The brain sends a message to the uh, immune system who in turn uh, cause the first symptom, which is nausea. So the nausea really is telling us that the next is going to happen, we're going to vomit. And what happens is that the vagus nerve sends a message from the brain down to the stomach to contract quickly to release all the poisonous material, the food and the bacteria. So we are not poisoned. Sometimes the bacteria are so many that they are all not expelled by vomiting and they end up in the small intestine. And when they get there, they start to multiply and the immune system realizes this and sends more of its antibodies, its, if you like, its good bacteria, to fight the invaders. And this battle that's ensuing uh, gives rise to the abdominal pain. Then diarrhea, which uh, is the result then of, if you like, the abdominal pain uh, seeking its uh, end cause, uh, is really where the, uh, another part of the immune system comes into being. Now normally the, the body, the human body, is, is brilliant in conserving water. And very little water is excreted in our feces. Uh, because when all the waste material goes into the colon, or the large intestine, as much water is extracted from the feces, from the waste material, as possible to be recycled into the human body. But the reverse happens if the immune system is aware that there's food poison bacteria in the colon. What it does then is, it does the reverse, it injects water into the feces so it becomes uh, more liquidy and then it's expelled. Um, so you get the diarrhea is caused by the uh, influx of water going into the feces to make it more watery to come out. So what the brain is trying to do is trying to excrete all the poison, uh, all the poisonous material uh, from both ends, if you like. Uh, sometimes food poisoning will only hit the, the top end of the body, so you just get nausea and vomiting. Sometimes just the bottom part of the body, and then sometimes it's the whole four. Now these are not serious conditions or serious symptoms, but the one thing that is serious through loss of fluids, through vomiting and or diarrhea is dehydration. And dehydration will kill. <coughs> Excuse me, all the cells in our body require uh, copious amounts of water regularly throughout the day, even throughout the night. 
uh, to work. Um, um, without the cells working, they will die. If they're part of an organ, the organ will die, and, um, and eventually, eventually we will die. So it's important to, that we remain hydrated. That's quite easy in the UK because uh, we can um, get uh, clean water, chlorinated water from our taps. We can drink bottled water, squash, etc. But where you've got countries where uh, they have things like natural disasters, earthquakes, floods, um, and uh, other natural disasters, the water supply becomes infected, so they've got no clean water to rehydrate. So you get a lot of people dying from the secondary cause of uh, the disaster. So if you've got a flood, for example, you get a lot of people dying from uh, drowning and etc. <coughs> but the secondary cause of death would be from the dehydration. So the last thing to look at for this slide is at-risk groups. Now, there are four groups of people that are more susceptible to food poisoning than healthy adults. Uh, they are the elderly. Um, the elderly, uh, their immune system tends to be weak. Uh, it's, it's easy for them to get food poisoning, other illnesses and disorders. And it could adversely affect the elderly if they get food poisoning. Whereas, say, with a um, healthy adult, they could just end, end up with a bit of uh, vomiting, diarrhea. It can actually kill the elderly. Um, in fact, in 1996, which was the worst E. coli food outbreak, 24 people died in the UK and were shown in Scotland, and all those were elderly people. Uh, the next are the very young, um, the reverse uh, of the scale, if you like. They haven't developed an immune system yet. Their organs are still quite weak. And any people that are ill, already ill, or hospital patients are immunocompromised. So if you're already ill, the, the human body is brilliant in, in fighting one disease or disorder, but if they're already ill with one disease, for example, it's very difficult for the immune system to fight against food poisoning as well. Hospital patients tend to be at a low ebb, um, stress levels are higher, they tend to be weaker, and they could be attacked by food poisoning a lot easier than healthy adults. And people whose immune system is compromised uh, could be that they've got a disease that's uh, causing uh, that, such as AIDS, or it could be that um, they're on drug therapies, uh, or they've just had an organ transplant where they've got to be given immunosuppressant uh, drugs, and that then, if they get food poisoning, could actually cause serious complications. And the last is pregnant women. Uh, not so much the pregnant women, but the unborn child. Um, certain bacteria such as Listeria, um, E. coli and Salmonella can seriously affect the unborn child. Uh, so again, it's important to ensure uh, what you're eating um, is safe, um, especially when you're pregnant. Uh, I'll give an example. This is uh, a cheese, camembert cheese, um, but it's made from unpasteurized milk. Now, unpasteurized milk could contain uh, amounts of uh, food poison bacteria that could compromise the fetus's uh, safety. So it says on there, if it's, uh, there's usually a warning label, this cheese has been made using unpasteurized milk. Um, there'll be naturally occurring bacteria, some of those could be food poison bacteria. So they may be harmful to the health of pregnant women, children, the elderly, and anyone with a low resistance to infection. So again, you need to be careful uh, with the types of food you eat uh, when you're pregnant. So that's unit one over. What I'd like you to do now, if you just click on the link below, uh, the revision test for unit one, uh, there'll be six questions for you to answer. Uh, at the end of the test, then it'll ask you to send me an email um, and just click on yes to send via your email uh, program. And it just gives an example of uh, the results you're getting. Um, these are not part of the exam. Um, even if you fail the unit tests, uh, you may still want to go on to the exam, which is fine. It's just that if you uh, fail quite a few of the questions in the revision test, you might not be ready for the exam. So you might want to go through the units again.